Welcome to the Distinguished Lecture in the book launch today. Now I would request Professor Subramanian Raju, Dean International Relations to give the welcome remarks. Good morning to everyone. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Gurmit Singh, Pondicherry University. General Vinod Kandare, PVSM, AVSM, SM, retired, who is going to speak to us on comprehensive national power and security of India, Dr. Nanda Kishore. Associate Professor of uh, Department of Politics and International Studies, Dr. Richard Tiwari, Dean, Professor Mohanty, School of Social Sciences and International Studies, faculty members, research scholars, students, and friends. I cordially invite you all for this uh, today's uh, distinguished lecture and also book lunch, where we are going to have the lecture on very important and relevant topic because this is, uh, it is on national power and uh, security. When we talk about national power, invariably we look at how India is emerging as a leader, as economic power, as also emerging as a global leader and also represent the global south and it is uh, representing the voiceless uh, south. And also recently we have demonstrated, or India is rather demonstrated its capability, how India could look at the world. And also it is a time for the world perception of India. We used to earlier to look at how India looks at the world, but now the world is looking at India for a variety of reasons, not necessarily only military capability to be seen as factor for any country's capability, not necessarily nuclear capability, but also look at other factors that also determine a country's capability, where precisely India is seen by the rest of the world as uh, one of the leaders. And also we have seen yesterday this concluded G20 where we have demonstrated our diplomacy, the way we have articulated, the way we have shown to others that we tell what we practice and that is what we have taken the slogan Vasudeva Kutumbakam. This is all because of this national power, not necessarily military capability but also other factors that makes India to be seen as one of the leaders in the world and also the rest of the world is looking at India and India is in a position to reach many countries, India is in a position to have dialogue with many countries unlike others, despite they are militarily superior to India. So that is something where we need to look at how India's national power can be seen apart from other factors, how India is able to reach other countries and also the way we look at, the way we talk about and the national power makes us to think about Vasudeva Kutumbakam, how that could really when we are talking about one earth, one family, one future. And also we have demonstrated in our action, either in, during tsunami or during uh, COVID period, or when we are looking at how to tackle or mitigating the GHG emissions, how India, which is not responsible for GHG emissions, because its uh, emissions contribution was less than 3%, but still India has taken responsibility to look at and we have looked at uh, how 
mitigating GHG emissions are very important because we believe strongly versus our Kutumbakam, one family, oneness. And also we respect international law. We respect treaties. And also we have demonstrated in 2014 when ITLAS uh, verdict where it was given most of the area of water to Bangladesh, still India accepted. Otherwise India could have said no because no obligation. But then India wanted to demonstrate that how India is respecting international law. So this is the whole, whole is uh, weaving India and it is time for us to look at even the scholars can now look for how we can do research on world's perception of India. So I think this is the time for us to look at the India's national power and this is the right topic on which the today's guest of honor is going to speak to us uh, in the presence of Honorable Vice Chancellor. We are very grateful to Vice Chancellor who is despite his busy schedule uh, made it possible to be with us today. So thank you all and I once again welcome you all for this distinguished lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Raju. Um, we were supposed to have this lecture quite some time ago due to the paucity of time as Sir is also extremely engaged with the ministry and receiving foreign delegates and a lot of other works. Uh, at the same time, finally, this has been possibility because of the Vice Chancellor. Uh, we were able to do this particular one on a very important topic at this juncture itself when the G20 is happening and India's rise has been recognized in different parts of the world. Now I request the Honorable Vice Chancellor to deliver the presidential address. Thank you very much Dr. Nankishore and good morning and welcome to everybody here. Uh, we all look forward to this event called Distinguished Lecture Series. It is not for us, it is for these young students who are sitting here and I am very delighted to look at uh, students sitting on the pavement as well. This is what is called jam-packed hall and the moment you have that, it gives a sense of, immense sense of satisfaction that, well, people are uh, uh, feeling much better when we look at our own country's situation, the way we are in at the moment. We have uh, Lieutenant General Vinod Ji Khandare. You would have heard Professor Raju reading it, PVSM, AVSM, VSM, and uh, other uh, honors that he had. You would be wondering what are the SM, then we write retired. Now, I will not have time, but I will urge all of you to Google what is PBSM, ABSM, SM, VSM. You should know and in what order they are put and why they are put. So I would like you to know about it. And then you talk about Paramvir Chakra, Mahavir Chakra, Veer Chakra, Shorya Chakra. You should be knowing about it. There is a reason I am telling you about this. I am delighted to have uh, General Vinod here for a very important talk on uh, national security, which is a concern these days for everybody. And uh, this talk could not have come at a better time when we have just concluded G20's session yesterday with India leading and India achieving a great landmark by having a Delhi Declaration. In any of the events that we have of this kind, Rarely you find an, a perfect unanimity on some kind of a declaration which we had and the, the impression all over the world was, well, it will be, well, it will be there, it will be, it will go in the annals of history that G20 presidency was India and the event was held on this date. Uh, that's about it. This will also go in the history that they deliberated a lot but could not come up with a unanimous declaration for two reasons. One. There is a lot of economic difference between the countries which are there. And secondly, the Ukraine-Russia war is on. There is one quarter which is with Russia. There is another one which is with Ukraine. And when you look at our own position, we were striking a very wonderful balance between Ukraine and Russia. Because we are having trade ties with both of them and historic ties also if you look at it. So people were thinking that with this kind of diverse opinion and then the Western Bloc and Eastern Bloc of the good old, good old days being there and a uh, lot of Middle Eastern countries also representing, it may not be possible. But the way things went, the way we deliberated, the way heads off to our own Indian diplomacy, the way we managed, the way we went around 
without even one percent of an iota of a doubt, everybody agreed to that because we just said war should not be there. We should all look to the peace and our own philosophy of Vasudev Kutumbakam, which has been highlighted ample number of times, which ultimately led to the feeling amongst nations that here is a country which believes in coexistence. Here is a nation which believes in collective development, a country which develop, which believes in the collective development of humankind. Coexistence, peaceful existence, all those good synonymous which we can use are usable or can be attributed to the philosophy of Indian diplomacy. This is what we have highlighted and this went on in the same direction that every country attending G20 ultimately said, well, whatever India says, that should be the final word and nobody resisted and the Delhi Declaration is there. If you look at these points, I don't have much time to dwell on that. If you look at these points, they are so very useful that in the days to come, the, the presidency going to Brazil, another member, uh, African Union added to that. On technical terms, yes, one member added to that and we will be calling it G21. The whole direction will be from this uh, Delhi Declaration. The whole focus of international diplomacy will be now based on Delhi Declaration because this is what every country wants. You will say, what is the gain of India? I was reading in the newspapers in the morning and I heard uh, late night uh, TV debates. Many people were criticizing what is the gain India is going to have with so much of money spent and so much of uh, <coughs> pomp and show. What is going to be our gain? Well, you are forgetting that we have added one member called G21 now and that is not one member. That technically is a collection of 55 African countries. And we, when we all sit in the UNO, it is not one African Union, it is 55 votes. Senegal's vote and India's vote and America's vote is all one each. So therefore, from that point of view, India having gained a worldwide recognition in terms of a country which really believes in the welfare of mankind is the biggest gain that we could have thought of. And in that line, people have very, very clearly, very appreciatively spoken about the contribution India did during COVID time, how well we managed and how well we supported many nations who could not uh, have uh, their own vaccine. And we were the ones uh, who went ahead and helped them out. So this has gone a long way in the minds of uh, every nation. Then a word on Indian diplomacy. The way we moved during Ukraine-Russia war, the way we moved during COVID, the way we moved on many other issues, water related, trade related, infrastructure related, everybody went with a feeling that here is a nation which means a real belief in egalitarianism, in the real egalitarian society, not for one country, for the entire world. And that is where whatever you may do, ultimately it will culminate to the philosophy of uh, Vasudev Kutumkam. One earth, one sun, one philosophy, one nation, that kind of oneness. And that's what our, if you extend it further, I think I'm, I'm debating a little more. If you extend this to our religious philosophy, there is oneness everywhere. Every religion you talk about, we talk about one, oneness. We should be united, we should be positive. So that's the ultimate where people have realized here is one country we should be looking at. And during all these difficult days, our Indian diplomacy showed to the world that the, the, the real foreign policy is to look after your own interest. And if India looks after its own interest, that own interest would be ultimately pointing to the interest of the world because we have never looked at our own concerns. Whenever we express our concerns, we talk about concerns of the humanity, concerns of the world. So this is what has gone around to every nation. Now, last word, which I may not be very right because I am not a student of political science. When we press for our seat in UN uh, Security Council, permanent seat there, Ultimately, you know, it's the number that counts. And now 55 straight away jumping to our side 
would go a long way. People say, what is going to be the gain? This is going to be the gain. Yes, there is going to be an issue of veto power and all. But ultimately, when the whole ship is tilting to one side, that veto power will also not say that let us drown together. He said, no, no, let's save, save ourselves. So that 55, this side, that side, will certainly have a lot of meaning in future. Everywhere people are talking about India should be there. India would have been there in 50s had we had we treaded little carefully, but that's our history again. So we are on a right path. If somebody criticizes what is our gain, there has been tremendous gain. And now we have shown the word that here is one country, despite people calling it an underdeveloped or developing nation, we are now on the threshold of uh, walking across, across to the other side, developed nation. So this is going to be the biggest gain that here is a country which we should all look forward to if we have to look at the word peace, word coexistence, togetherness, developmental goals, if you have to achieve, then India is the right place. Well, that's it. I <clears throat> have been all along telling journal to our young students that this is a very interesting subject, particularly international relations and political science. There was a time, during our time, people used to say it's a very drab subject, don't get into it. Whatever is there in Morgenthau or uh, Palmer and Perkins or whatever books, old theorists will always say, well, this is the end of the story. It is not. It is an evolving subject. Every day when you read uh, editorials in the newspaper, you get different directions. So gone are the days. Now things are changing very fast. Middle East is not important. Old trade routes are not important. Indian Ocean is becoming the most important trade route. SARC is coming up. India is surging ahead. So things are changing so very fast that the whole philosophy of international relations is changing. Now if you will read any text, any book, you will find there is a totally different direction. So it's a very interesting subject like any of the science subjects where every day scenes are changing. And in that direction, I am delighted that uh, General Vinod Khandare has taken his time out to talk about national security uh, <clears throat> at a time when we really needed this talk. This talk is not important from our point of view, maybe. Well, we are reading, listening, everything. It's more important from the point of these young minds who are there. And I'm sure after listening to General's talk, you will get new vistas, new directions, new horizons in your own problems that what area to work in. And let me tell you, these are very interesting topics. Start working on it and you will find, which I've been time and again telling, you do very well, you, you excel when you start enjoying your work. And when you realize that this is a very interesting area, you will start enjoying to the hilt. I am not a political science student, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a chemist basically. But then, uh, when I read it, I get absolutely drawn into it and then I lose count of time, whether it is 1.30 in the morning or whatever, you keep reading. <coughs> That's what you'll find. So I'm very grateful to General Vinod Khandare. Uh, he's here to enlighten us on this. You would be wondering, well, there are many journals we come across. Well, you do. I'm not denying. But let me tell you, you would have seen uh, many professions, a minute more I'll take, many professions, civil services, police, postal department, academics, wherever you join, you join academics, you ultimately, by hook or crook, you'll end up as a professor. If you join police, IPS, whether your career is good, bad, bad reports, whatever, ultimately through CAT, here, there, we have seen, you will end up as an additional DGP or DGP. Everywhere else, you reach at number one or number two at best. Defense is one where they have so much of rigorous checks and balances that at every stage they have to go through uh, a very rigorous check. Every stage they have to pass an exam and if somebody becomes Lieutenant General, it has a meaning. Why I'm telling you, I'm telling you for this, uh, for your knowledge. You might be thinking, well, the way others become DGP here also, one becomes Lieutenant General, it is not so. Right from the day one becomes Captain, you start appearing in examination Part D, then only you become Major or Equivalent. Then further down you go to the Staff Council, Staff uh, College, which is as difficult as Civil Services Examination, maybe a little more difficult in terms of the number which is taken up. 
and there if you clear that you go for that brigadier or equivalent level then further down to that general cadre major general and onwards now if i give you a ratio if a 100 course mates are going to be joining either ima or nda or whatever means through which you are joining one out of this probably would reach the level of lieutenant general because it is not that uh, uh, ex minister has recommended and so and so has given a letter as it happens in the other services here they will go through their own uh, rigorous tests and then only one would be promoted and somebody having achieved here this rank it has a meaning and when somebody writes that's what i want you to study but pbsm absm bsm that has an additional meaning a lieutenant general reaching there many would be having absm not pbsm so if somebody has that that uh, goes to the credit of that officer that he is highly decorated all over and when they reach this level let me tell you they are real all rounders every day they change the the situation and they face that in war like it is not a bookish thing that you have to go this way and then fire five bullets here depending on where you are they will apply their mind and do it and indian defense has done exceedingly well reason for that is that we have a very rigorous system which through which every officer comes up and uh, they do so very well that's why we are proud of our defense forces because they look at our country as one in defense forces nobody talks about is a sikh is a christian is this they all sit together and the kind of respect which is there in defense it is amazing a fellow coming and joining another station there is no accommodation another officer will say here is the key of my house use whatever way you want i am on my annual leave i'll come after 60 days nowhere else you will find if at all somebody gives it he will say look i am giving you this these rooms these two rooms you will use don't open my fridge don't open my kitchen under the restriction they'll put it but here they'll give the key and move away that kind of brotherly feeling is there only in defense it's a great organization so if you happen to be doing anything for defense not necessarily as an officer in the defense but anything through icwa or through your writings be very positive for our defense forces because they are the ones who require maximum accolade maximum appreciation because they are the ones who are real savior and whatever our country is it is also on the strength of our defense forces that we are reaching this particular uh, level so i will not have much time but i am i am extremely happy that general is here and uh, i am sure he is going to be enlightening you with his own uh, experience with his own reading and uh, when some officer talks about security concern i think there can be no other person better than a person of the rank of lieutenant general who has spared time for us to be with us and uh, last word for the youngsters after the lecture is over let general not be relaxing you put uncomfortable questions that you have in your mind so that he enlightens you to the extent he would be able to do it right now and that let me tell you will go a long way in your research careers that which direction to mold your phd and mphil and other degrees thank you very much for joining here i wish you continue to have this kind of a response to our lecture series and i i am sure with these our uh, yumi sark shall grow from strength to strength thank you very much and god bless all of you and welcome to jab thank you sir one must be wondering how fluently he speaks on issues of international relations and defense and anecdote he was supposed to be all his uh, classmates juniors seniors everybody is topmost officers you must have seen including the foreign minister from shringla to everyone he also is a stephanian so it is that legacy because of some domestic issues he did not give his civil services otherwise he would have also ended up as a diplomat and that's the blood still runs in him that's why he so comfortably speaks about um, issues of international relations and other things uh, we'll have the book launch uh, reimagining india in the geopolitics of the 21st century or edited by me and a friend of mine mr um, prashant vaidyaraj unfortunately because of his health issues he was unable to join us here i request um, the guests on the stage to do the honors nam kishor had mentioned about yesterday's g20 events i was feeling so thrilled when i was looking at the main dais prime minister sitting in the middle mr dr jay shankar on his this side harsh shringla on the other side amitabh kant on the other side 
and the Ajay Banga on this side, the common thing was they were all from St. Stephen's. So this is something, and they all were there. When uh, I was there two years this side, that side, but what a remarkable performance it was. Everybody contributing to the bit, uh, which led to what we have seen in the thing. So this, uh, you feel a little happy and proud of the fact that you also walked the annals of the same place. Thank you. To have this book coming in the... He is a mentor, a uh, an advisor, a friend, and someone whom I always looked up to when he was still in his service. Uh, because not that he has achieved ranks, not because he's a big man, not because he's advisor to the defense minister, but because he's accessible, because of his humility, because of his simplicity, and he was able to come in. And I always wanted him to be the first one uh, in whatever capacity that I would organize the lecture here as a distinguished lecture. I wanted him to be the first one. And he has gladly been here, sir. Extremely thankful to you for being here. Uh, without wasting much time, let me introduce Lieutenant General Vinod G. Kandare, PVSM, ABSM, SM Principal Advisor, Ministry of Defense, ex military advisor, National Security Council Secretariat, ex DG of the Defense Intelligence Agency, and Deputy Chief of the Integrated Defense Staff. Lieutenant Kandare was a former military advisor to the National Security Council Secretariat. He retired on the 12th of October 2021 on completion of his three-year tenure. He is in service of the nation since 1979. Prior to that, he was the Director General of Defense Intelligence Agency and Deputy Chief of the Integrated Defense Staff, handling trio services intelligence till 31st of June 2018. He has a vast experience of four decades in handling military affairs and has been involved in advising the apex level of decision making based on analysis and assessment impacting national interest. He has first hand combat experience on Siachen Glacier in dealing with China on LAC, in active combat with Pakistan on LOC, and in countering terrorism in the hinterland of Jammu and Kashmir and with various terrorist groups in the Northeast region. He has enhanced synergy between technical and human intelligence at tactical, operational, and strategic levels. He is an expert in capability and capacity enhancement, including Atmanirbad mission and defense diplomacy. He synergized interministerial output related to security. He is an avid thinker in conflict resolution, conflict prevention, management termination, as also in technology search and incorporation. He played an important role in evaluating formulation of reforms in the security sector itself. For displaying gallantry against Hezbul Mujahideen terrorist groups in Kashmir, he was awarded the Sena Medal in 2001. In recognition of his dedication, he was awarded the Ati Vishisht Seva Medal in 2015 and the Parama Vishisht Seva Medal in 2016 by the Honorable President of India, who is also the Supreme Commander of the Forces. He was also awarded the Chief of Army Staff Commendation Card and the Western Army Commanders, uh, Commendation Card in 2012. Crisis management has been his strength and destiny during his service, be it terrorist attacks at Patan Kot, or Patan Air, Patan Kot Air Base, Uri, Nargota, Jammu, and our surgical strikes in Pakistan or in Myanmar. There are many more treasures and experience he has, which perhaps you will be able to unfold in the time to come. Currently, he is a distinguished fellow at the United Service Institute, New Delhi, and the Emeritus Research Faculty at the Rashtri Raksha University, Gandhinagar. He is active in giving lectures and participating in international, national, and armed forces seminars. He renders advice to various ministries and think tanks and pursues the Atmanibar Bharata, Bharat agenda in defense production as well as in shaping youth as the national human resource capital for the present and the future. He is working on ancient and medieval period wisdom lessons derived from history for the military and the non-military way forward. He is now the principal advisor to the Ministry of Defense. More than anything else, last year, uh, since I joined, we made an effort to send our students for internship and he took the sole responsibility of placing some of our students in Center for Air Power Studies. And more than anything, some of the students had the fortune of visiting more than once to the Ministry of Defense, which perhaps would not have been a possibility at the stage of being a master student and breaching all those security lanes and reaching out to him and having a discussion with him with his busy schedule. Sir, we appreciate your presence here and it's an honor to have you here. Over to you, sir. Good morning, Vanakkam and Jehan. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be standing in front of you and having been spoken of so highly 
by Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Gurmeet Singh and my friend uh, Professor Nanda Kishore. Uh, prior to that, Professor Raju has spoken, and it's an apt introduction to the topic uh, for which I am standing in front of you. While I look at you, I am visualizing a large number of future luminaries for the nation. There will be thought leaders, there will be administrators, there will be intellectuals. So when I am talking to you, it is a kind of a responsibility on me to be informing you of what exactly comprehensive national power and comprehensive national security is. Uh, many people feel that those who serve in uniform are not able to understand the nitty gritties of these two most important topics which the nation faces on a daily basis and it's a long term vision that needs to be brought in. So when I'm talking of uh, vision, you know, you would read in many places that India lacks strategic culture, India lacks a national vision and there is no document which talks of uh, national security or national strategy. So as a practitioner, I would try to unveil all these things based on my experience. When in the armed forces, we greet each other, we say Jai Hind. Why do we say Jai Hind? Has anything ever struck you that why do people who are in the uniform talk to each other and the moment you meet each one, you say Jai Hind? The simplest explanation and the richest explanation is, these are two words, Jai means victory, Hind is my country, victory to my country. Can there be even any simpler description of a national vision? Why is it so simple? It is so simple because a farmer from Uttar Pradesh or from Bengal or from Manipur or from Kashmir or from Gujarat or from Kerala or Tamil Nadu who has joined as a soldier, sailor or an airman has to be focused on that national vision which is visualized by the Prime Minister and not one Prime Minister, a series of Prime Ministers. The connect between the vision of the head of the state or head of the government and the practitioner has to be common. So when we say India has to excel in everything, whether it is Olympics, whether it is economics, whether it is culture, whether it is military operations, whether it is internal cohesion, we have to be victorious all the way. In such issues, while we can say that, for example, in Olympics or in any kind of sports, there will be a position gold medal, there is silver medal and there is a bronze medal and then there can be somebody who is fourth. But in military operations, there is no runner-up in war. Either you are victorious or you are vanquished. So we have to prepare our armed forces right from the beginning and grill into them the thought process that even if you are sick, even if you are on leave, even if you are not fully prepared, but there is no other solution but to be victorious. Because the country cannot afford to lose any war. What we did in 1962, there is never a repeat to 1962. I am taking you towards the comprehensive national power because when we say we lost in 1962, did the military lose? The nation lost. Do militaries go to war? Nations go to war. So every citizen has a role to play in trying to build up the comprehensive national power. And when you build up the comprehensive national power, then you must have security of this power. Take your mind back to history when people say that India was Sone Ke Chidiya, that we were so rich that everyone was looking only at India. Whether it was the Arabs, whether it was the Turks, whether it was Christopher Columbus who started on a journey, landed up in America and thought he had come to India. Everyone wanted India's riches. 
everyone wanted to come and be a part of the economic wealth that India had. Where did we go wrong? We went wrong in comprehensive national security. Unless do, these two concepts are balanced, unless they work together, no nation can claim to be a position of eminence in the global hierarchy. You look at any other country, you will always find similar thing. But there is a difference. While I do not want to discuss the concepts, but I will give you my own understanding about this. There were invaders and there were colonial masters. When they came to India or they went to other parts of the world for conquest, they had only one thing in mind, power. So when you look at the Western thought, they had looked at power in two dimensions. One is economics and second is military power. So they even today, the West talks of national power. They don't talk of comprehensive national power. They talk of national power. They look at it like a coin with two sides of the coin. One is military and second is economics. I will amplify this. When the colonial powers went, whether to America, whether to Africa, whether to Asia, their whole idea was to get as much riches as possible using military not the soft power. If at all soft power was there, it was again with the aim of spreading religion and to change the mind of the people there. So it's like a binary. It is military, it is economics. How do we classify this? Remember 1857 when Robert Clive defeated the governor of Bengal, Sirajud Dola. And thereafter, now I am recounting an anecdote which has historical evidence. So after Robert Clive had defeated, using his East India military, a company having a military, which is unheard of, but he had that military, and he was able to defeat a stronger military using various methods whether it is treachery, guile, whatever you may call it. And thereafter, they sent a letter, I am talking of 1757, they sent a letter to the British Crown to say that, look, East India Company has captured this area, but East India Company is incapable of administering this entire landmass. So what do you suggest? What are the directions from the Crown? The advisor to the monarch was one gentleman known as Mr. Ferguson. Mr. Ferguson advised the monarch that we must write a letter to Robert Clive and say that, look, you are a company, you have been sent there with a purpose of becoming rich. And while you become rich, England becomes rich. So the only thing that we expect from you, whether you administer righteously Maliciously, immorally, it doesn't matter. You have to clean up the riches of that country and send everything to England. That was the letter which was sent by Ferguson on behalf of the monarch for East India Company. And that's exactly what happened. All those who are people who deal with history will try to see that between 1757, 1857 and subsequently till 1947, this landmass which was Sone Ki Chidiya suddenly became so poor, our agriculture dwindled, our people suffered, there were plagues, there were droughts, there were famines. Why did this happen? Everything was being eaten into what was otherwise national power of India and that was most importantly economics and what was also being eaten into was the Indian small kings having their military. The Europeans had an advantage of industrial revolution because of which technology was better than what Indians had. 
so the military with less number of people was able to overcome larger numbers the same thing had happened earlier when the turks had come in when the arabs had come in when the mongols came they had better mobility better firepower while indian various kingdoms armies were moving on elephants these people were moving very fast using horses they were using gunpowder they were using cannons they were using firearms and that's exactly what even the british did so using these two things the economy was weakened and the military was weakened this is as far as the western thought process is there now let us come where did this topic of comprehensive national power get added how did comprehensive get added to that when you look at the eastern thought oriental thought we are different from the anglo saxon we are different from the westerners the chinese were the first ones who started talking of comprehensive national power or so is said today after 1949 the chinese started their journey at times stumbling at times falling at times going in the reverse direction but ultimately they come to the era of deng xiaoping and there they say look we have to avoid wars we have to avoid conflicts we will not waste our resources and we'll use every possible resource of the nation keep getting stronger keep avoiding conflicts till we come to a position of power from where we can decisively win in any field whether it is technology education economics whether it is commerce diplomacy but we will bide our time deng xiaoping used to say hide and bide hide your strength bide your time come to a peak in the comprehensive national power and thereafter dictate terms it's only after xi jinping came to power that he started getting assertive and aggressive possibly if xi jinping had also continued for some time the present state of flux between usa and china would have been more decisive i think he opened his cards a little too early so when he started talking of multiple dimensions of a nation's capability that is when he added comprehensive national power so how do i differentiate between national power the western construct and comprehensive national power the oriental thought there i gave you an example of a coin which has two faces but if i tell you the oriental thought process on comprehensive national power it is like an uncut diamond the more cuts you give it the more value it adds to the diamond so that's a very simple way of remembering that comprehensive power comprehensive national power is like a diamond the more cuts you give it the more shapes angular perfection you give it the diamond becomes that much more costly so china is one such example where it has played its cards well when i am saying that china decided not to go to war what am i saying in 1950s they went to war with tibet so i told you there were certain stumbles that they did then i told you that 1962 war they defeated india yes that was one more event but they did not sit down and capture and stay there they realized that they must get back and get their act right over a number of years their political leaders and our political leaders their diplomats and our diplomats have been at the negotiating tables quite unlike our western neighbors after 1962 and possibly one short while of 1967 india and china have never fired a bullet at each other because of certain understanding that look we are not going to war okay we can have our tussles our transgressions along the line of actual control but we are not going to war why did we say that many people feel and there is a very rigid thought in many minds 
that militaries of countries are meant to go to war. I would give my assessment here that militaries of nations are there to prevent wars. You are there to deter your adversary that they should not have any evil designs, otherwise there is punishment waiting around the corner. So the first thing that we should get clearly in our mind that militaries do not go to war, nations go to war. Secondly, militaries are there to deter your adversary. Now, since I have used the term adversary, it's very difficult to identify who your actual adversary is in the present day context of new wars. New wars, when I say, I am talking of moving from conventional to unconventional, from kinetic to non-kinetic wars. When we say conventional and kinetic, these are militaries which are fighting each other. The impact of that is definitely felt on civil society. And after a particular war, which is conventional in nature, any country, whether you are a winner or a loser, you go back in your economy by at least 10 to 20 years. You have to again struggle hard to get back to where you left your trajectory. But in non-kinetic warfare, which is the new era warfare, which is unconventional. Countries are fighting each other on economics, environment, education, cyber, space, information domain. So these are the various domains where unconventional wars are being fought. How does it happen? Now I will give you some examples. 1947, India and Pakistan became independent just with a day's difference. How do you rate India's economy today vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan economy? Around that time, India invested very wisely in having a green revolution, in having big dams being built, steel mills for which we borrowed money and expertise from Russia. We started our IIMs and IITs and look at where our human capital has gone and where because of that your economy has reached. Look at your neighbor, your neighbor whom you inherited. You did not choose but you inherited. In that place they spent a lot of time in putting these young minds into madrasas. They were busy creating Mujahideen to fight into Afghanistan, into Kashmir or wherever you want. They were busy providing mercenaries. Now mercenaries do not give an economic boost. Mercenaries do not give intellectual boost. Mercenaries have only limited thinking. They can only do what they have been told. And they have been told that they have to lay down their life or get killed for whatever ideology that is being told. Now, there is a stage where you look at your foreign exchange reserves. Indian foreign exchange reserves are crossing 600 billion. And in Pakistan, the foreign exchange reserve is 8 billion. Out of the 8 billion, 6 billion are which have been borrowed and one or two billion are based on the remittances which come from abroad where their people are mostly in blue collar jobs. Compared to that, the Indian young leaders are heading most of the multinationals in the western world. So when people say that India does not have strategic culture, then what is this? While wars were heaped on us from the west, but we kept on doing whatever we had to do to do conflict avoidance and build our economy, build our human capital, build our institutions. So we kept on growing. Our diplomatic gains have been much more. Okay, compare the economy of Pakistan and India till about 1965. You will see Pakistan was ahead of us. India was trailing. Now, why did it happen? After 1947, Pakistan chose to join the American camp. 
India by thoughts of socialism continue to be with USSR. So obviously, the kind of doles which the Americans were putting into Pakistan was huge. The amount of money that was being poured was huge. Americans never do anything for free. Americans are supposed to be the most transactional people. So if they were putting money there, they had some reason to do so. They wanted to use Pakistan as a base to counter USSR during the Cold War. Then things started changing after some time and Pakistan created political instability. There were a number of coups. In fact, they have a history. Till date, none of the Prime Minister has completed his five-year tenure. They have had a number of times when the military has overthrown uh, the democratic, popularly elected government. I can't say popularly, but elected government, yes. They have had a military leader hanging a Prime Minister or an ex-Prime Minister, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. They have had a general who changed the entire education system and radicalized the entire society. Nothing like that has happened in India because our military believes in the constitutional power. Our military believes in the democratic institutions which we adopted between 1947 and 1950 and we continue to respect that. Is it only about Pakistan? In our neighborhood, you can see similar things happening. All around us in South Asia, democracy has always been threatened or most of the time threatened by military. In India, it doesn't happen. Again, reinforcing that Indians right from the ancient times have had a strategic culture and a democratic culture. Now, people will say that we've had kings, so how do we call it democracy? The entire world was at that point in time being ruled by kings. We had some good kings, we had some bad kings. We had number of kingdoms. People talk of nation state. We describe ourselves as a civilizational state. And in civilization, there is a code of conduct, there is a mode of behavior. Somebody from Kanyakumari could go right up to Badrinath, crossing maybe 50 kingdoms. And they were all respected. They were all looked after. The pilgrims were looked after even if they did not know the language. That is a civilization. That is beyond the concept of nation state which we get from, say, Greece. So there is a thought process that we have inherited. We have to cherish it. We have to take it ahead. When China talks of socialism with Chinese characteristics, same as the thing here. Democracy with Indian characteristics is the way that we have to customize our methodology. We don't have to copy or ape anybody. We are much older than them. We have much more experience than them. People talk of our scriptures not being there or recorded history not being there. This is also a myth. I want to give you a small example of what strategic culture is there which boosts the comprehensive national power and comprehensive national security also. Sometime in 320 BCE, we had the Maurya kingdom coming up and rising to such levels and all because of an unique combination, a very rich combination between the king and his advisor, Chandragupta Maurya and Chanakya. So when I gave you that example of Western thought and Oriental thought, now I am taking you ahead to the Indian thought process. Chanakya describes in various ways how a nation should be run, how a nation should be protected and how a nation should expand its influence using hard and soft power. So there are various theories which he has propounded. There is one theory which is extremely interesting, it is called the Saptang theory. In Saptang theory, he talks about the entire nation as a human body. And in that human body, there are seven ang, seven parts of the human body that he describes. The person who rules the kingdom or the person who rules the state 
is called as the Swami or he is the head of the state. He says like a head of a human body is the one which thinks about your entire body. The Swami thinks about the state, the welfare of the state, the increase of power of the state. So that is the Swami. But the Swami can't do it alone. So he has to have a number of advisors whom he calls as the Amatyas. So Kautilya or Chanakya, his original name was Vishnu Gupta. He was the Amatya, he was the advisor. There were other advisors also. And then he gives out the code of conduct for the king, the code of conduct for the Amatyas also. And then he goes on to say that any state or nation or kingdom, whatever name you want to call it by, must have something for itself. So what is that? That is the Janpada, that is the people and the territory. He very clearly gives out that if you don't have territory and you don't have people, then you can't call yourself a state. Then he says, okay, I have territory and I have people, but how do I grow? So I must have kosh, that is the economy. So I must build up my kosh and that is when the people will be happy, that is when my influence will increase. But to protect that, I must have dand. Dand is the military. In fact, he goes beyond military and he says security. So in security, it is internal security, it is external security, it is intelligence. All kinds of elements which are required to protect your state from the evil eyes of the neighbors or the invaders is what is called as dand. So many times when you hear people saying that, you know, Chanakya Niti said, Sam Dam Dand Bhed, you all have heard of that? Okay. The chronology is Sam Dam Bhed and then Dand. When everything fails, that is when Dand has to be used. But probably over a period of time, all such things get contaminated. So maybe this sequence also got contaminated. But finally, this is how he mentioned. I am not going into the other parts, but this is what exactly is a strategic culture that you have people, you have territory, you have somebody who rules you, you have somebody who advises them, then you need money and then you need somebody to protect that. All that put together is comprehensive national power. It's so simply put. And this has been put even before Christ was born. Then what happened? Why did we lose it? We didn't lose it for quite some time. We lost it around 1200 CE because that is the time when the invasion started, when the libraries of Nalanda and Takshashila were being burned. So that is when a lot of people from the intellectual lot and the academic field, they started taking away very precious written work and hiding it somewhere. So from 1200 onwards, we didn't have a written copy of what Chanakya had written. It is only in 1905 that in Mysore, in one of the museums, a scripted copy of Arthashastra was located. And by the time we got to understand what it was, it was about 1912. So does it mean between 1200 and 1912, our kings did not use Chanakya Niti or we did not follow Arthashastra? No, it is not that. How it changed was somewhere around that time when you realized that there were a lot of atrocities which were being put against the population and especially against the learned population where they were put to sword that this concept of passing information and knowledge from father to son, from guru to shishya became stronger. The mental faculties of Indians are even today very strong and they were able to memorize. And then those learned people were able to advise the kings. Now it's a different story. Some kings were very receptive to knowledge and there were some kings who were very arrogant. Those kings who were receptive to knowledge became great. We remember them even today. I'll give you a very small example. 
you look at Shivaji, he didn't go to Stanford or he didn't go to Eton or he didn't go anywhere, but he was taught by his mother at home, which we call Sanskars, and he was taught by his guru. Now, Dadaji Kondev was the guru who was responsible for his initial training and subsequently the spiritual growth was with Swami Ramdas. Now, how did it happen? You know, today when you hear of people talking in editorials or in that prime time debate that India is faced with a two and a half run threat and people are getting alarmed and while we are getting alarmed the TV channels TRP is going higher. But at the end of it the younger population gets confused. Ki if there is uh, such a threat and then what is India doing? I will tell you what India is doing. But I want to take you back to the time of Shivaji when he had more than five front threat. But he still emerged victorious. He had the Mughals against him, he had the Adil Shahi, he had the Qutub Shahi against him, he had the Nizam Shahi against him, he had the Portuguese, he had the British. Everyone was breathing down his neck. But he knew how to juggle. He knew how to use diplomacy in trying to control somebody. He had his intelligence where he knew who is preparing to come and invade me. He learned from the tragedies of the Vijayanagar Empire. He studied that carefully and he was able to understand that when five adversaries combine together, there is no hope in hell and your military may be the strongest but you will still suffer. And that's what he learned. He also learned from the Yadav Empire of Devagiri where he realized that if intelligence is bad, you may have numbers in your military, you may have your treasures full, but you will not be able to protect yourself. He realized that when the Khiljis or rather when the Tughlaqs were right on the doorstep of Devgiri, that is when he woke up because the intelligence was very poor. People had become arrogant in their power. In fact, again from the point of view of giving a lesson, some of our ancient people have said arrogance can be described in two parts, arrogance of power and arrogance of youth. Now most of you are youth, so I will amplify this. When you look at those kingdoms which just crumble despite being strong, it is arrogance of power. You are not willing to look beyond your nose to see how the other person may be looking weak or may be posing to be weak and he is able to overpower because you have had arrogance of power. Arrogance of youth is at places where a person who is young says that he or she knows everything. There is no need to study any further and that is where young leaders make mistakes. So there is always wisdom in trying to understand the difference between information, knowledge and wisdom. If you click Google, you can get everything possible. Maybe your professors also may not be able to tell you, but Google will tell you. But is information everything? Information has to be churned with experience to understand how you should be going ahead with that piece of information or you should be keeping it away. That is called knowledge, which means you analyze information and then you make wise assessments and that is what is known as knowledge. And when you add further experience to it, that is what is known as wisdom. So most of your professors are in that category of giving you wisdom. So never ignore what your professors tell you, what your parents tell you, what your grandparents tell you. They are the people who with experience and a lot of analysis and assessments are able to make a difference in what is pure information and what is wisdom. The shorter the gap is between this journey, the faster the nation progresses. Okay, now let me come specifically to Indian situation and the regional and global situation related to comprehensive national power. Military I will talk 
at a later stage. I have already explained how economics makes a difference. If you have money, you can buy weapons. If you have money, you can educate people. If you have money, you can create infrastructure. If you have money, you will get an entry into G20. If you do not have money, you will stay outside, not even a guest of honor, not even a guest to come and attend the proceedings. When Bangladesh went away from Pakistan, and today Bangladesh gets a seat as an invitee in G20 and Pakistan does not. One reason can be, okay, India must have had its say and not letting Pakistan come into that, possibly. But what is the GDP variation between uh, Bangladesh and Pakistan? Huge. 1971 to 2023, how has this happened? They focus themselves correctly. Their foreign exchange reserves are massive. Bangladesh does not have the kind of cotton that is produced in India or what is produced in Pakistan. Then how do they have such a flourishing textile industry? And that is where human resource comes in. They have a huge human resource and they realize that they will not be able to go beyond a particular line. So they said, okay, we are going to control our population. Again, there is a difference between what Bangladesh did and what China did. But they realized that the human resource can become a positive resource if they can control it and then they can skill it. Every member of Bangladesh is looking at contributing to the national economy and to the national power. So that is the difference between Bangladesh and Pakistan. I told you about population control. Even India, when we say we have a 1.4 billion population and we take a lot of pride, what should be looked at? What is the contribution of 1.4 billion to the national economy or to the national strength? In China, they immediately announced that we will have a one-child policy a few decades back. And then the ill effects of that started coming up because one child, no other sibling, psychological issues, sociological issues, dependence of senior citizens, an aging society, that started happening in China. But did China give up? No. When you identify a problem, then you come up with a solution. China immediately started doing a lot of research and development with the help of USA, of course, and started working on unmanned autonomous systems, whether it is in industry, whether it is in the service sector, whether it is in the production sector. And by going by mass scales, they were able to reduce the cost of these, this equipment. So ultimately, low cost production and exports increased. So even when there was a problem with China's population, they were able to convert that into an opportunity. And today, most of the production which is happening in China is so low in cost that they can beat any other Western or even Asian manufacturing house hollow. So you have to find solutions. Let me take you to another issue, which is food security and agriculture security. People will say it is the same. It is not. If it is agricultural security, then you need raw material to run your factories. You need these factories to churn out enough for your own consumption and more for exports. Then your foreign exchange reserves rise. When your foreign exchange reserves rise and the kind of foreign trade you have and there is imbalance in trade where you have given them more, they have given you less, then in diplomacy you have a leverage over these countries which, has, which have a negative trade balance with you. China does that very often. India has yet to start doing it because our exports are yet not reached at that particular level. Food security, a small example. 1962 when we lost the war against China and we were humiliated, we still feel humiliated, especially people in uniform, even today we feel bad about it. 
but we realize that there is no point in sobbing or crying you have to stand up and get stronger 1965 field marshal ayub khan in pakistan decided that this was the time to hit out at india because his assessment was that economically we were weak and politically we were weak because jawaharlal nehru had passed away in 1964 and he did not consider much about lal bahadur shastri whom he used to call as a five foot dwarf so he decided that this is the time to go in and claim territory as much as possible so in 65 the war started which they had started and it continued in the gulf of kutch some parts of rajasthan till such time lal bahadur shastri decided that okay we need to hit out and get our act together what was the problem then the problem was we did not have enough food grain we were dependent on australia we were dependent on america large ship loads of wheat used to come from there does a prime minister just announce that we are going to war even without thinking about food it can't happen a prime minister has to think about everything and that is the time he and his advisers came up with a policy that okay let's go to war but at the same time involve every citizen of this country and tell every citizen that this is your war so he said and i remember i was a child and i heard him over all india radio in his famous speech in which he said that we have been attacked and we have to respond but we have a problem of food americans have refused to give us food but we will fight with discipline and he as a prime minister said that he would have only one meal a day and in a week he would have a fast for one day and he said this as a prime minister i am urging you to contribute the entire nation went on a similar model of one meal a day and a fast one days fast in a week and that was the food which was provided to our armed forces when you have a problem of food security you cannot even defend your own rights and since then the green revolution the white revolution everything possible started and we started getting stronger and stronger and you saw the difference what happened after 1965 even though we lost an excellent prime minister then but in 1971 we were able to create two parts of our western adversary and eastern part became bangladesh never in the history post world war 2 have 93000 soldiers surrendered to any nation which they did to us after that we went in for a simla agreement in which we said our issues with pakistan will be bilateral not multilateral so you are able to extract something out of it okay we could have got something more than that but the point we are, i am trying to bring out is unless you are strong in your food security you will always be juggling between whether to do it or whether not to do it but once your food security reaches a level that you are able to provide to all your citizens and also have enough stocks and further give it to people outside then that diplomatic leverage works let me come to the next topic of energy security and this is particularly important now that the entire world has woken up to a global response to pollution the entire world was working on fossil fuel somewhere around 1973 the oil producing countries decided to raise the oil prices and reduce the production and the entire world was in a turmoil because the western nations were supporting israel so that was the reason that in 1973 this happened and it was in 1973 and subsequently up to 1975 that g7 got formed initially g6 then g7 it became g8 and then they threw out russia out, out of that so it is the g7 that you see today g7 was a grouping of those countries 
which were very rich and they decided that okay if we are being blackmailed by oil producing nations then we'll use our riches to discipline them which means what if you don't have oil you may be very rich but single handedly you will not be able to do it so you have to again use your diplomacy and you have to get people together and then with that money you will be able to leverage the world diplomatically similarly whichever country is able to get control of its own energy requirement it can claim some kind of a victory in this russia ukraine war which is going on today the western powers are still dependent on russia to a large extent for fossil fuel it is interesting that they are backing ukraine but they are buying energy requirements from russia in the bargain they are financing russia this is not called economic engagement purely this is called economic entanglement when countries are entangled and for their own survival during winters in europe they need gas and they need fuel they have no place to go but to the oil and gas producing nations americans were smart they worked out a technology where shale which is produced shale oil which is produced they will able to become self sufficient but that didn't happen in rest of europe so europeans were never able to tell the russians that please stop this war or stop this war they they never could do that and they are still at a receiving end so when energy requirement is there even china is in a very tight spot because it doesn't produce as much of fossil fuel as it requires you would have heard of the term malacca dilemma that most of the oil which has to come to chinese mainland or to its eastern coast it has to pass through the four straits these are the choke points while we could have spoken of all those four choke points but we are talking only of malacca dilemma which is essentially that the entire oil and the trade has to go through these four choke points and any country which has a strong maritime presence that is the americans can immediately choke the chinese fossil fuel requirement china has done china has taken action to overcome that it has started improving its navy from what it was nothing to quite an extent today the ship building and the submarine building as it at a very fast rate they have built up their strategic reserves to more than 200 days requirement for the nation they have built up oil pipelines through myanmar through pakistan through europe through central asia so they are finding solution they don't give up easily and that is what is the oriental strength that if you identify a problem you don't give up you find a solution so the energy requirement is fossil fuel today the entire world is looking at controlling pollution so renewable energy and the biggest lead here has been taken by china it is the global manufacturing house for solar panels they have worked out various technologies whether it is hydrogen fuel whether it is fuel cell technology whether it is hybrid technology using solar or wind so they are doing that when i talk of energy requirement along with that comes the water part also water security is extremely important any country which is an upper riparian state that is water flows from there like china is in most of the cases an upper riparian state brahmaputra flows from there satluj flows from there indus river flows from there mekong river flows from china and then what does china do it immediately looks at leveraging its power as an upper riparian state on to the middle and the lower riparian state india classically in some cases is an upper riparian state in some cases we are the middle riparian state and in some we are the lower riparian state 
so we have to balance our act into all these three after we became independent in 1960 we had an indus water treaty for water sharing between india and pakistan so out of the six rivers the three western rivers were promised bulk of it to pakistan and the three eastern rivers were promised to india in my little understanding i must say that the 1960 indus water treaty between india and pakistan was the most over generous treaty in favor of pakistan and as we look at indian population growing today and we realize that our northern states are also water stressed why are our northern states water stressed bulk of our water which was promised to pakistan has gone a large amount of our water which is actually ours also escapes to pakistan because we don't have the storage capacity but we built so many dams then what happened understand that himalayas are young mountains every year with monsoon or with glacial melting when water flows at a rapid pace it brings a lot of debris which gets into these big dams so the storage capacity keeps reducing okay at that time these were the solution now what is the solution now so india is looking at creating more canal networks more kind of an options for waterways so that our water which is otherwise flowing into pakistan which actually belongs to us should actually be utilized by our farmers and our people in cities and these interstate clashes for water sharing should reduce so that is what the government looks at it always it is only in 2016 when we faced that uri attack which all of you would have heard of some of you would have seen that film also after that uri attack the prime minister took note of the fact that a large amount of excess water is released to pakistan and that is when these additional waterways canals new dams all this started coming up and the pmo took full control of this kind of a project to say that our water is our water we will not encroach on your water but we will definitely not provide our water for you to become rich and thereafter finance terrorists so that was one of the things that uh, we must have really done something right but from 1960 to 2016 is the time delay that we went through since we are on water security let me tell you china is also quite water stressed so what did they do they also went on the same path big dam three gorges dam you all would have heard of three gorges dam there is a lot of pressure on the ecology there and chances of earthquakes you have seen climate change you have seen climate change where excess rainfall or at time least amount of rainfall this is one part which the entire world is facing china is also facing that india is also facing facing that additionally china as it keeps growing economically stronger it realizes that it is vulnerable because its eastern coast which is the richest part of china is vulnerable to american designs so they want to gain strategic depth and bring up their economic growth to the western part most of it is actually inner mongolia tibet autonomous region and xinjiang province but there is a problem these are cold deserts so they need water they need energy they need food grains so china started a project of constructing dams on those rivers which flow out of china whether it is mekong whether it is brahmaputra they are still looking at indus and possibly satluj also but i will talk about brahmaputra they have spoken of five dams being constructed and thereafter while they call it that these are run of the river which is meant only to produce electricity then logically your analysis should say electricity for what so electricity for people who will be brought in from other provinces into tibet they have a plan of hanization of these areas that is the han race which is considered to be the purest race in china
has to come in and replace the Tibetan and the Uyghur Muslims. So that water has to be pumped. Pumping can happen only with energy. So that is exactly what the plan is, so that agriculture and electricity can be drawn out of this water. What impact will it have on our Indian uh, national power? It will have an impact on India as well as Bangladesh also. Because your agriculture will get impacted, your people will get impacted. In the bargain, what will happen? There will be a demographic shift. People will start moving to those areas where there is water. And which are those areas? Those are part of India. So that is what we have to again look at. What else about climate change? We have to be alert toward what our adversaries are doing. When I said we have to identify our adversaries, clearly today two adversaries are identified, China to the north and Pakistan to the west. But when crisis develops, somebody who is your friend could also become an adversary. So you always club identified adversaries and potential adversaries. Somebody's behavior can change when the situation changes. Up to a particular time, time in 1962, we thought Americans were helping us. But subsequently in 1965, they helped Pakistan. So they were no more our friends. Could we have looked at them as adversaries? Possibly yes. Because somebody who is helping your enemy obviously will fall into that category. In the latest era of new wars and new threats, take for example cyber warfare, India faces hundreds and thousands of cyber attacks every day. And when you analyze those cyber attacks, not every cyber attack succeeds, but when you analyze those cyber attacks, everything is not coming from China and Pakistan. It is coming from other nations as well. Why are other nations looking at attacking India through cyber? Somebody doesn't want us to become powerful. Somebody wants to gauge what is our technological capability today. So maybe IITs will get attacked, maybe our corporate houses will get attacked, maybe our atomic energy installations will also get attacked. So this is a continuous process and in cyber war, this is a good option for not going to conventional war but at the same time degrading a nation. Cyber option is something where no one can pinpoint that this attack came from X or Y. It is non-attributable, it is deniable. So more number of countries are opting for getting strong in the cyber space. There are countries which face threats from bigger nations or stronger nations, technological superior nations. They have found solution to that also. Like Estonia faces a threat from Russia. Estonia has put all its data into Luxembourg. This is a strategic partnership. Because through cyber, your data is at threat. And if your data goes away, which in any case from India is going every day because the internet is not owned by India, the digital platforms are not owned by India, what you use as WhatsApp or Facebook, all this is owned by the West, so all your data which you are putting on it is going away. You may say, sir, what does US have to gain from my data? Obviously, there is something which they are going to make use of. And these are dots. When they, you connect these dots, there is a lot of information and vital information which can be gained. You may be connected to somebody. That somebody is connected to again somebody. And through big data analysis, you are able to make some kind of a sense and you are able to peep into the data of this country. How do they think? How do they behave? How do they react? What are they dependent on? What kind of routine do they lead? What is the schedule? Like a small example, if you use cyber to attack a country and get to know what is the traffic pattern, you get to know when are the tunnels closed, 
you will be able to hamper the mobilization of that country's military. If cyber is used to attack the energy grid, the railways will stop functioning. The military movements will paralyze, will get paralyzed. So this is what is cyber. Using cyber is another domain which is called the information space. Information. All of us since morning, the first thing we do when we get up, we look at the mobile. That is information. So more often than not, I call a cell phone as a six inch weapon. That six inch weapon is firing at you every day and you are leaking your information unknowingly. Now that particular information domain is being used by certain countries like China has a three warfare strategy. What is the three warfare strategy? The first is legal warfare, the second is psychological warfare and the third is public opinion warfare. Legal warfare, change the mind of the entire world to feel that China is all powerful and they must follow China. Change the maps which is called the cartographic war, cartographic aggression, change the map. In the maritime domain, they came up with initially what was 11 dash line, then 10 dash line and now it is 9 dash line in the South China Sea where they say because our ancestors were moving around in this area, so this belongs to us, which impacts bulk of the ASEAN nations. ASEAN countries are not powerful, so they perforce have to obey what China does. They are not in a position to take a stand. So this legal warfare where they say that 9 dash line means so much of sea territory belongs to us. All routes which go through that will take our permission. Same thing they apply against India that they look at Tibet as the palm of a hand and then they say there are five fingers emanating from this palm. One is Ladakh, second is Nepal, third is Sikkim, fourth is Bhutan and fifth is Arunachal Pradesh. And they claim that these are parts of China because Tibet is a part of China. This is again legal warfare. The next part is public opinion and psychological warfare. China has been extremely good at both these. They build up narratives, they plant their narratives internally and externally. So internally their entire population has to remain as one homogeneous population, absolutely loyal to the Chinese Communist Party. Chinese Communist Party has to keep the people together, loyal to them, so that all external threats can be handled properly. Interestingly, China is the only country where a party has a military. In India, a country has a military, but in China it is the Chinese Communist Party which has People Liberation Army as loyal to the Chinese Communist Party. Whenever the generals are being appointed, and that's when the Honorable Vice Chancellor was saying that in other countries, people go by who's more loyal to their political party. In India, it doesn't happen like that. We are most apolitical and we have nothing to do with politics. So there, when you look at People's Liberation Army, their brainwashing, their psychological conditioning is such that if an order is issued by a functionary of Chinese Communist Party, they have to obey. Very interestingly, when they have their units and structure of a battalion, a brigade, a division, a corps, everywhere there will be a commander and along with that commander there will be an advisor who is a member of the Chinese Communist Party. So even before the commander of that battalion or brigade or regiment decides to attack, he has to take clearance from the Chinese Communist Party person who is sitting next to him. The performance of this colonel, brigadier or major general is being done by the Chinese Communist Party representative who is sitting next to him. But that is their way of wielding power over the military. Why? 
they are always scared that the military will do a coup. So the political influence on their commanders is continuously done. Is there a similar thing on the Western Front? Yes, of course. They also believe in information warfare. They have an organization for intelligence known as the ISI and for information or influence operation they have ISPR. Whenever there is something which has to be conveyed to the world, you will find the Pakistan Army's Chief of Army Staff meeting foreign dignitary. It doesn't happen in India. So the Pakistan Army runs Pakistan, ISI runs Pakistan. And the third one is for religious ideology, the clerics. So these are the three people who are always termed as the deep state. Information warfare, Pakistan does well, China also does well. So when we talk of collusivity between Pakistan and China against us, this is one of the major threat of the information warfare. And bulk of it is done by using cyber or sleeper cells. These are the two elements which normally threaten your comprehensive national power and this is a threat to your security. One more issue which is a new domain now and it is related to science and technology and that is look at a new domain which is space. We all are extremely happy that Chandrayaan 3 went to moon, southern part landed extremely good. We are all happy that in the year of 2019-18-19 we did an ASAT test in which we were able to kinetically drop a satellite. That's happiness, very good. But space asset security is also to be done physically as well as against cyber attacks. So we need to develop this capability. ISRO is doing extremely well going on to strategic projects but somewhere in 2018 the government created a new agency called the defense space agency that is now looking at the security of our assets in space it is looking at security of our data which gets downloaded or commands which get uploaded or the ground stations which are looking after space assets we are looking at space assets being multiplied. In the Russia-Ukraine war, you would have seen, in the initial part itself, Russians had knocked off a large number of Ukraine space assets, but it is because of the West that many such satellites were provided through private companies to Ukraine. Similar thing will happen if we have a problem with China, our space assets would be vulnerable. So we have now diversified and bifurcated strategic assets, strategic protection, security to our assets will be done by Defence Space Agency and rest of the commercial aspects, exploratory aspects will be done by ISRO. Around the same time in 2018, October, along with the Defence Space Agency, a Defence Cyber Agency has also got created. Defence Cyber Agency is also meant to work along with other elements for protection of our critical assets, critical infrastructure, whether it is finance, whether it is energy, whether it is railways, whether it is uh, foreign offices. So again there the security part has been assigned to some elements out of the intelligence community, specifically NTRO and the second one, the Defence Cyber Agency. In cyber, there will be some people who will be extremely good hackers, who will take the positive role of going across and attacking our adversaries. But the bulk of the problem is the defence, cyber defence. Each one of us is using an electronic device. Each one of us is using that device based on internet. So the vulnerability is always towards the weakest link in the chain. Every citizen today is a weak link unless you have something known as cyber hygiene, you have cyber consciousness 
and you are able to say that look my phone will not be hacked or if it is hacked i will report immediately so i explain to you that space is also vulnerable through cyber information domain is also vulnerable through cyber your critical infrastructure of finance electricity mobility everything is vulnerable you heard of number of times when some hacker has defaced a government ministry's website such things will happen so you don't have to get worried that your website has been defaced or hacked they do it we also do it what is more important that from your data there should be no loss of data that is more important and uh, recently when you saw the parliament passing a data protection bill that is one more step towards protecting your data protecting your national security if your data from atomic energy plants leaks or from reserve bank it leaks you have a lot of problems why doesn't it leak out of the military we have our own independent networks we have our own independent system if we are connected somewhere to internet we do not put military information onto that device so there is an air gap between what is a military network and what is a civil network let me also tell you very briefly how do we ensure the comprehensive national security to elements of comprehensive national power the pmo has understood a very clear requirement of two apex level bodies one to propel our national growth so there is niti ayog which is responsible to the pmo only and the second one for security is the national security council secretariat nscs let me talk about the nscs the nsa shri ajit doval kirti chakra he is the nsa he heads it and under him in nscs there are four apex level officers three deputy nsas and one military advisor i was the military advisor for three years so i am telling you with authority how it happens there is a deputy nsa who looks after strategic affairs and it will always be a foreign service officer so mr pankaj saran who was an ambassador earlier in russia and then in bangladesh headed that vertical for nearly about 3 and a half years then he was re relieved by mr vikram misri who has been an ambassador in china and myanmar the second deputy nsa is for internal affairs the first deputy nsa for internal affairs was honorable governor of tamil nadu mr anand ravi and then he moved out as governor to nagaland and then moved to tamil nadu and he was relieved by an ex intelligence bureau officer mr datta patsalgikar who after his 3 years has gone and now presently he is in maharashtra and he's been recently appointed to investigate of what wrong has happened in manipur the third deputy nsa is mr rajinder khanna he's been there for nearly 5 years now and he heads what is known as technology and intelligence so between him and the military advisor future technologies worked out future technologies for civil and future military technologies and the fourth one is the military advisor the first military advisor was lieutenant general prakash menon who is now in takshashila institute that's a think tank in bangalore i followed him after a gap of about 2 years and then i was relieved by lieutenant general anil chauhan who is the current cds and he has been relieved by air marshal sandeep singh who retired as the vice chief of air staff so at this level you can make out that very carefully people are selected and given tasks there have been two more additions thereafter identifying the requirement of uh, security so in maritime domain we have the national maritime security coordinator vice admiral ashok who was the vice chief of navy earlier he's been there for nearly 2 years now and we have the national cyber security coordinator earlier it was mr gulshan rai 
then followed by Lieutenant General Panth, and Lieutenant General Panth has just retired from there, and Jeff, J Lieutenant General M. U. Nair is now the National Cyber Security Coordinator. What does the NSCS do? NSCS does a lot of research work, a lot of analysis, comes up with assessments and recommendations and gives it to the NSA. What does the NSA do with that? The NSA uses this information and briefs five top decision makers who are a part of the Cabinet Committee on Security. The Cabinet Committee on Security is headed by the Prime Minister. There are four more important ministers, the Finance Minister, the Home Minister, the External Minister and the Defence Minister. These are the five people who are responsible for Cabinet Committee on Security. They are briefed by the NSA, not in the CCS, but in the National Security Council. The NSA is not an elected member, so he does not form a part of the CCS. He does his briefing to these five people in the NSC, and then he withdraws, and this forum becomes the CCS, where decisions are taken by the elected members of the people. So when people say that, Everything is done by bureaucracy, that may not be entirely true. Vital decisions are taken by the CCS. What happens if you have calamity or disasters or dangers which are not pertinent to these five ministers? Then in the NSC, that particular minister is co-opted. During COVID, the minister of health was co-opted there. When there was Something which Pakistan did, say, let us say, related to atomic energy. Then the Minister of Science and Technology or the Chairman BARC is co-opted in NSC where they brief the CCS and then the CCS withdraws and takes a decision. How else can we empower the NSA? Under the NSA, there are two more or rather three more such entities. One is known as the National Security Advisory Board comprising of eminent people. What is the number of people who can be in NSAV? It's not standard. The government decides that, look, this is what is our prime concern. And they co-opt a member who is an eminent expert in that field. Like when we are talking of climate change. Climate change is extremely serious business and every country has to realize as described by somebody, it is a nuclear war in slow motion. Now, Indian experts have to take a call at that. So, in the NSAB, there is an eminent person who has handled this part. He is one Dr. Devinder Sharma who headed Bhakra Bias Management Board and then went on retirement to Himachal Pradesh, his home state. He was pulled back and he was brought to NSAB where he is working on this climate change, energy security as well as water security including the Indus Water Treaty. Semiconductor chips is a very serious issue. So immediately there, two people were co-opted. One Mr. Anshwan Tripathi who is a Stanford graduate who has been pulled back from USA and put there to see that how we should be able to move faster on the semiconductor chips. A person known as Mr. Sridhar Vembu, quite a few of you would have heard his name. He's come back from USA. He started his own corporate house and production house. He's been co-opted there, again, for technological growth. Our relations with US are growing. How can we ensure that we harvest most out of it? So a retired diplomat from there, Ambassador Arun Singh is a member of NSAB. We need to balance between Russia and China. So Ambassador Pankaj Saran, who was ambassador in Russia, has been put there. We need information as much as possible about China. Military information, Lieutenant General Narsiman, who is an expert in, on China military affairs, has been there for three years. Now he has moved out. Now we need more information about their technology intelligence. So Mr. Jaydev Ranade, who was in RNAW, has been put there. What am I trying to tell you? that NSAB is a group of people who are absolute experts. 
they work out recommended action plan and that is taken by the NSA to the NSC and the CCS and that is where decisions are taken. One of the retired person from ISRO, Dr. Radhakrishnan is there. There is a lot of joint work which has happened because of which the Chandrayaan-3 or the solar mission, everything is going with top speed. There is another group which is for the assistance of NSA, that is the strategic policy group. Now strategic policy group, when you go to Google, you will find a whole lot of people as members. No, the, it's not a kind of a circus or something. It's a focused work which is done. Experts are co-opted. Like you all would have heard that Pakistan tried to upset our uh, policy part and our internal cohesion by putting the Sikh community against us. So they started the initiative for Kartarpur. Kartarpur is a holy shrine of Sikhs which is in Pakistan. And they offered immediately. That is when Imran Khan had just come to power. And they said, okay, Sikhs from India and all over the world can visit Kartarpur. Now that was something which was very difficult for uh, the foreign minister to understand. So in the strategic policy group, the DG police from Punjab, the army chief, the DG BSF, and people from NSCS, we sat down and we worked out what needs to be done. When URI happened, when URI happened, how did we go in for the surgical strikes? This is the kind of closed door discussion which happens, which is not given out to the media unless we have some gains to take from there. So when Doklam happened, when URI happened, when Balakot happened, this is how the government gets into a very closed door discussion whether it is at 2 o'clock at night, whether it is 5 o'clock at night or early morning and decisions are taken and then they are implemented. One more thing which I want to tell you, there is something known as the uh, Defence Planning Committee, DPC. It has been given four charters, out of those two important ones I will cover. One is about the forward area or the border area infrastructure development. We have been lagging there, so in the last about four to five years, we have done very well there because that planning committee gets the defense secretary, the home secretary, the foreign secretary, the expenditure secretary from finance ministry and uh, the three service chiefs, the intelligence people. And there it is discussed that how much of money is required for creating forward area infrastructure. And there itself in that closed door, the finance or the expenditure secretary is told, look, we want this. And at the end of the meeting, the NSA takes that paper, goes to the defense minister and says, these are the decisions we have taken. He goes to the prime minister, informs him that these are the decisions we have taken. And the implementation starts the moment CCS approves it. So this is how the national security is being safeguarded. One of the most important part which we have been lacking so far is our we are dependent for military equipment on Russia. We are dependent on military solutions on America or Israel. So that is when the government started this Atma Nirbharta mission. We must become independent technologically and production wise. And the moment we become, no one is going to then hold us to ransom. There was a particular conflict when we needed tanks. Nobody was willing to give us tanks. They were willing to give us tanks after one year. They were willing to give us tanks only by paying five times the amount, the prices. This is not the way we should be functioning. So that is where the Atma Nirbharta mission has started. And Atma Nirbharta mission is not only restricted to defense. It is in every ministry. COVID, we realized what pharma industry was to us. So we started there. We started in practically every ministry, Atma Nirbharta mission. And that is where the youth have joined in as innovators, as designers. The government has started many missions, whether in the Ministry of Small and Medium Enterprise, MSME, in the Ministry of Defense, what is known as the IDEX challenges. So everyone is encouraging people to give ideas we are still in that evolution stage, but sooner or later, we will stabilize there. 
so this is in general how we want to protect our comprehensive national power by creating structures creating favorable processes creating an ecosystem and joining various silos our ministries function independently so that is where for growth niti aayog joins them for security nscs joins them and every month and every quarter nscs and niti aayog sit together and plan together that is on a regular basis but if required even in the middle of the night they sit together and they work together so that in a nutshell i have been able to explain and like the honorable vice chancellor said please shoot uncomfortable questions i'll answer thank you sir the last 20 minutes that he spoke about the national india's national security architecture and the way decision is made perhaps you will not find it in the public domain he's been kind enough to allow us to um, record it and then use it as well thank you dr nandakishor so um i would like to start by saying that uh, i see a lot of familiar faces here in this auditorium and uh, with whom i have a very good connection but at the same time i also see a lot of new faces and uh, today was actually sir supposed to be our orientation program for new students who have enrolled in the department of politics and international studies so um you know i believe that um, for you there perhaps couldn't have been a better way of having uh, an orientation session or starting the new semester because from day 1 we are making sure that we are steering you towards a path of contemplation and research so i take dr nanda's um, um approval and uh, along with vote of thanks i also want to welcome all the new students with a round of applause for all of them here so um so i think it wouldn't be wrong to say that uh, we had an incredible morning filled with profound insight and wisdom and we had the distinct privilege of uh, listening to our distinguished guest lieutenant general vinod ji kandare and on behalf of all of us present here today i stand before you to express a heartfelt gratitude and a warm and resounding vote of thanks sir Your lecture has been enlightening and your extensive knowledge, eloquence and depth of experience has left an indelible mark on our hearts and minds. Your words have not only educated us but also inspired us to reflect deeply on the matters of national security and defense. Your decades of dedicated service to our nation and your unwavering commitment to upholding its integrity and security serves as a beacon of inspiration for all of us. your insights into the concept of comprehensive national power and various elements that contribute to the nation's power and influence including military capabilities economic strength technological advancement diplomatic influence has provided us with a rare glimpse into the world of military leadership and security of india so uh, th this was definitely an excellent lecture and it i would say it was like a crash course on national security and national power and uh, you know it was a crash course because like he used the three terms it was um, you know a whole package of information knowledge and wisdom and then his lecture was very beautifully analytically evaluated and summarized by dr nandakishore i would just want to add one philosophical insight because like most of you here know that um, i read sri aurobindo a lot so uh, just you know in the spirit of interdisciplinary learning and approach i would like to add a philosophical aspect to it where i quote sri aurobindo and where he said and which is very relevant today um, you know where he said that uh, all problems of existence are essentially problems of harmony now nine words one statement but you can but it kind of encompasses everything you can apply it to the social life you can apply it to political life you can apply it to economic life to foreign relations to diplomacy conflict resolution this one statement where he says that all problems of human existence are essentially 
problems of harmony not even on this wide scale but even in your personal life so, you know when you have a um, kind of tiff with your brother or your sister or your parents this idea of harmony or the lack of harmony is at the root of all uh, conflicts so that was uh, my reflection on that i would also like to thank our respected vice chancellor professor gurmeet singh ji for joining us this morning his tenure as a vice chancellor has been marked by various uh, visionary approaches his steadfast commitment and an unyielding dedication to the pursuit of academic excellence his support for faculty staff and students alike has been a cornerstone of our university's success i now take the opportunity to extend gratitude to professor subramanyam raju dean international relations for delivering the welcome remarks and as we all know venue is a crucial component in the successful of this distinguished lecture and so i wholeheartedly thank professor raju for his kind and generous gesture i would also like to thank dr nand kishore for organizing this seminar and i also extend my heartfelt congratulations to him on the occasion of his book launch as your colleague i have had the privilege of witnessing your diligence your passion for research and your contribution to our academic community that has been invaluable and your book launch today is a testament to your continued dedication to advancing knowledge in our field i would also like to thank all deans head of departments and faculty members for your kind presence a special thanks to dr radhika head of emrc for recording and photography arrangements a big thank you to all our fellow students for your active participation thoughtful questions your enthusiasm has actually been the driving force today i would also like to express appreciation to all those who have worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make this event possible office of vice chancellor special mention mr rajkumar our phd scholars from the department of politics and international studies vijay and amit and a university uh, public relations officer mr vimal transport section and everyone who has contributed to the seamless exe uh, execution of this lecture thank you so much everyone jai hind